Hello, friends. I hope you're out wandering through nature, exploring the natural world around you. Do you enjoy writing about your wanderings? Nature journaling is an awesome, fun way to remember all the adventures you have taken and how you felt during those journeys. If you're looking for some beautiful journals to keep track of all your wanderings, I have several available on Amazon, including some guided journals for children. Start your journey in journaling by clicking on the link in the show notes. Keep exploring the nature around you and keep journaling all your wanderings. Hello, friends. I'm Paul, and of course, this is the Nature Wanderer Podcast. It's good to have you along today. I've been doing a lot of winter bird banding lately. You probably heard the latest episode about bird banding. And if you did, you know that I do get a lot of black cap chickadees in the nets. And when I do, I call them... The poodle of the bird world. I'm sorry if I'm insulting any poodle owners, but if you know poodles, they're a little dog with an attitude. They think they're a big dog and they can take on anything. Well, that's the way chickadees are. When I'm taking them out of the net, there's days where I would rather have a hawk in the net than a chickadee because the chickadees just bite and bite and bite. Yeah, they just don't know how to settle down. I mean, first of all, once they're in the net, they're like, oh, crap, I'm stuck in a net. And they start fighting to get out of the net. And that just makes things worse because they get more and more tangled, which means it takes me longer to get them out of the bird banding net. And then once I have them in my hand and I'm trying to get the net off of them, they're sitting there biting me. So yeah, little guy with an attitude. And they're the guys that even though they're not a lot of fun to take out of the net, well, they are an adorable bird. I absolutely love black cap chickadees. And a lot of other people do as well. So I want to talk a little bit about them because they're really fascinating animals. Now, first of all, I have to get the Latin name out which if you know me, I'm not great at pronouncing the Latin names. So we're going to give it a try. Peccoli atricopilis is the Latin name. And hopefully I pronounced it right. If I didn't, go ahead. You can do the DMs, send me an email, whatever. Just let me know that I massacred it. But anyhow, the black cap chickadee. Now, he is the most common and most widespread of the seven species of chickadee. Yes, there's more than just one type of chickadee. Around my neck of the woods, western New York, everyone just calls them chickadees, but their official name is the black cap chickadee because there are seven species of chickadee around the world. But the most common and the most widespread is the black cap chickadee. Now, the name actually comes because if you've seen the black cap chickadee, you know they have that black cap. So almost like a hat on top of their head, the crown of the bird, as we call it, is black in color. And they also have a black bib. But the black cap is where they get the name from. The black cap chickadee dee dee chickadee dee dee that's the call that they make, the most common of the calls. So black cap chickadee, they actually are one of the few birds that says its own name, chickadee dee dee, and I'll do the calls for you later. Now they are rather small, they're only about three and three quarters to four and three quarter inches in length, and that includes the tail. They, as I said, have that black cap plus a bib. So underneath their chin, there's black there too. We call it the bib. They have a gray back and then they're white on the belly and sides. It's almost like a whitewash. So it sometimes can look like a dirty white, but it's white on the belly and the sides. So that's the black cap chickadee. And as I mentioned earlier, they do have quite a feisty attitude. The little guy with the 
bad attitude, but it's all about survival with these little guys. If you're little, yeah, you end up having to basically have that attitude to survive in nature. Where are they found? Well, their habitat is forests, thickets, backyards, parks. You don't usually find them a lot in open fields. Every once in a while you will, but they're mostly in the open fields if there's a lot of shrubs, a lot of tall grasses. They don't like to be out in the open very often. The reason is because of their size. They are small. It's part of their protection. So that's why you mostly find them in the forests and thickets. But if you do have feeders, you probably in love with these guys because they're at your bird feeders all the time. They are adorable little birds, and I love the calls of them, too. Now, they are found in northern U.S., southern Canada, and part of Alaska. So, mostly it's the northern part of the United States and the southern part of Canada. But you also find them in part of Alaska as well. Now, their vocalizations, their calls. Now, most of the year, I always hear their most common call, which is that chickadee dee 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 chickadee dee 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 which is the one that sounds like this. And then they do also have the mating call, which is more of a... Now, I'm sure everyone's heard that, but they probably didn't know what bird it was. That's actually the mating call of the black-capped chickadee. So you mostly hear that in spring, early summer. I have heard it in the winter as well, but it's mostly used for a mating call. And then, of course, they also have alarm calls, individual ID, territorial food calls. So they do communicate with each other through these calls. And like I said, they get their name because of that chickadee dee dee dee. They do say their own name. And I did read in my research about chickadees that the more DDDs that they do in a call, the higher the threat level. So if there's danger around, you're going to hear a chickadee dee 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 constantly going on with that dee dee dee. So they're having more. The more you hear, the higher the threat. At least that's what I read. Now, their diet, I always see them at my bird feeders, but I also see them out in my field once in a while, hiding in the tall grasses, and they're eating some of the grains that they find in the field. They like seeds. They also will eat insects as well. It varies by the season. In the summertime, they're mostly eating seeds, berries, and insects. And then in the winter time, when it gets a little bit tougher to find insects and berries, at least up in their territory, remember northern U.S., Alaska, part of Alaska, and southern Canada. So they're around in the winter in cold, wintry weather. So it's hard to find the insects and berries. So they're mostly in the winter eating seeds, but they also will sometimes eat carrion or dead animals if you're not familiar what carrion is not a staple of their diet but hey you get what you can 
you eat what you can. It's all about survival. So if there's carrion around in the wintertime, they'll eat that. During the summer, no, insect seeds and berries. And they actually are very, or they can be, very tame. Now, I'm sitting here telling you that these guys have an attitude. I hate taking them out of a net because they're always biting me. But I have seen where people have tamed them down. And by taming them, I mean by letting them eat out of your hand. Now, I don't encourage this. I'm always promoting to keep your distance from wildlife. Don't disturb wildlife. Don't try to tame it down. And definitely, wildlife belongs in the wild. Do not keep wildlife as pets. It's not only immoral, it's also illegal in most places. So try not to tame them. So I'm not going to encourage this, but I have known of people I have seen where they will actually take seed, place it in their hand, and they stand there and the chickadees will actually come, land on their hand, and eat the seed right out of their hand. They used to, I don't know if they still do, but they used to make these cardboard cutouts of a person with a little hand sticking out of it and you could put a little bowl full of seed on there. And that's how you kind of get them used to the people so that they're not scared of it. And then you slowly replace that cardboard cutout with you holding the seed in your hand. And they will just come up and they will eat right right out of your hand. I've never tried this. I've never done it. I have no intention of doing it. I did go up to Algonquin Park in Canada once. And up there, the gray jays are tame to do this same thing. They're very used to people and they're a very social bird. You can go up there, put seed in your hand, stand there real still, and the gray jays will come and eat right out of your hand. Now, the reproduction of the black-capped chickadee is usually in spring and summer. That's mating season, spring and summertime. So that's when you start hearing that mating call, the whistle. And they are very monogamous, not like most songbirds. Songbirds are usually anything but monogamous. They will sometimes find more than one mate a year. But every year, they just go out and search for a new mate. That's why the males are so colorful and have that beautiful song to attract a female. But with chickadees, I mean, if you look at chickadees, you can't tell the difference between a male and a female unless you have them in your hand. Like when I'm bird banding, during mating season, you are checking for either a cloacal protuberance or a brood patch. And that's the only way to tell a male from female. So they are not trying to impress the females. The males are not brightly colored to do that. Instead, they just find a mate and they mate for life. So very monogamous. Unless, of course, the mate dies, then they will find a new mate. Now, they are cavity nesters, so they do like to find holes in trees, cavities in trees. Now, it's not just cavities in trees. They also like cavities in nest boxes. Yeah, if you want to attract a black-capped chickadee, put nest boxes up. And you can place them not in an open field, although I have had chickadees nesting in one of my nest boxes that I have in my open field, which are for the bluebirds. But this one is surrounded by honeysuckle. It's just got honeysuckle all around it. The the chickadees feel safe around it. So they have used this one nest box of mine year after year. This year, I'm actually going to be making some nest boxes just for the chickadees. And I'm going to be putting them up in the woods because that's where they like to nest. They feel safer in there. So yes, they are cavity nesters. I will leave the link for plans to make these nest boxes. I'll leave it in the show notes. So check out the show notes and I'll leave the cavity nesting box plans right in there, the link to it. Now they usually will lay one egg per day. And this is true with a lot of birds. It's tough to lay an egg. It takes a lot of energy. So if you are laying all your eggs all at once, wow, you're wiped out. And it takes a lot of 
time and energy to take care of those babies. So why not spread them out? So one egg per day averages between six and eight eggs, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. It sometimes depends on the year, how much food is available as to how many babies they'll have. So one egg per day, average six to eight eggs. The incubation period is a mere 12 to 13 days. So less than two weeks, 12 to 13 day incubation. Wow, that's quick. The males are very helpful during nesting season. They will be the ones who, well, the female is sitting on the eggs. They're out collecting food for her. And once the babies hatch, both parents, including the males, they don't just disappear. The males will actually help to feed the young. So they're constantly out looking for food, helping to feed them. Now, the birds do fledge at about 16 days. So that's 16 days after they hatch. They will fledge. So another two weeks. So you have from the day that they're they're laid, the eggs are laid, to the time that they leave the nest, you're talking about four weeks, maybe a little longer than four weeks. So it's not a long period of time. Now, Because it's so short, you would think that they're going to nest more than once a year. But usually, they only have one brood per year. So they're not the type like some other birds, like my bluebirds that I get every year in my nest boxes. They will nest twice a year a lot of times. But a chickadee, usually only one brood per year. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard the term bird brains, or hopefully no one's ever called you bird brain, but not all birds are unintelligent. They're actually pretty smart, if you think about it. I mean, the black-capped chickadee caches their food in the wintertime to help them survive the winter. So they, in the nicer months of the year, they will gather food up and they will hide it or bury it. Now, if they were so unintelligent, we'll put it that way, they wouldn't be able to find it. Scientists have actually discovered that the black-capped chickadees are able to increase their memory capacity each fall and throughout the winter by adding brain cells to the part of the brain that supports spatial memory. They actually found in their studies that that part of the brain actually expands by 30%. That's that they can remember where they hid or stored all these food stores so that they can find them in the wintertime. And then the spring, it actually shrinks down again. So all of this is about survival. So when you say bird brains, it's not an insult. It's actually probably a a compliment because some birds, like the chickadee, they expand their brain in the fall so that they can remember where they're stashing all this food so that in the wintertime they can find it and they can survive harsh winters. As a matter of fact, They're one of the few small passerines, which is what we call songbirds. They're one of the few small passerines that can survive harsh northern winters. Yeah, whenever it gets really cold, really harsh winters, the chickadee can survive easily because of a couple of things. Well, first of all, that food storage, they will cache their food, they will hide it, and then because of the increased memory, they will be able to find it again in the wintertime. So even during storms, when it's really hard to find food, maybe all the seed is buried, maybe your neighbors forget to fill the bird feeders. Oh, I hate driving down the road and I see empty bird feeders. It's like, this is when they need it the most, not in the summer. Yes, I'm always saying that bird feeding is more for our pleasure than the birds. They're usually finding stuff out there, but winters can get tough. So they're able to stash their food so that they can find it in the wintertime. And when the temperature drops 
and it gets really cold or maybe a snowstorm or some really bad weather, the chickadee actually goes into short periods of what we call torpor or another term for it is controlled hypothermia. So they actually drop their body temperature by 10 to 12 degrees. Now, if you think about it, dropping their body temperature, slowing down their heart rate, slowing down their respirations, all saves energy. That saved energy means that they don't need as much food. They can survive these cold temperatures. Now, it's not all winter. They don't go into a hibernation. It's just a torpor, a short period of controlled hypothermia. Now, other times, and I can contest to this because I see them all the time at my feeders when I'm doing bird banding, they will also cluster together. So they will form these groups during the winter, these small little clusters of chickadees, and that way they can well, basically huddle up together, stay warm. Don't you like snuggling on the couch in the wintertime with your significant other? That way you can stay warm while you're watching, catching up on all the shows that hopefully you were missing all summer because you were outside exploring nature. But anyhow, the chickadee does the same thing. They cluster together to stay warm. Now, you may wonder, why don't they just migrate? A lot of other birds do, even small birds about the same size as chickadees. You have birds like the warblers who are insectivores, but they're about the size of a chickadee. You know, they head south for the winter. Well, migration is not about size. It's not so much about cold. It's mostly about food. And the chickadees are able to find their food. If you want to say they do a minor migration, I guess you could say that because sometimes, I mean, like the ones up in Canada will maybe move a little bit further south into the northern U.S. or maybe from western New York here, they might go down into Pennsylvania. But usually they just stick around in the same territory year after year, season after season. So they do not migrate. So that's why they have these special techniques to s survive the cold winters that controlled hypothermia, the hiding of their food or caching their food, and also clustering together. So grouping up together. During mating season, spring, summer, chickadees are not so friendly with each other. No, like I said, they do mate for life. So they find their mate, they lay eggs, they raise a family, and they stick together all summer. And they don't want neighbors bothering them while they're trying to raise their young. So in the wintertime, it's different though. In the wintertime, they will cluster together. Now, they do have in these groups that they hang out in, and they do have loose groups in the summer, too. I shouldn't say they don't hang out together at all in the summer. I see groups of them at my feeders all summer long. But it's not as ordered as during the wintertime, not as large a group. And in these orders, they do have a very rigid pecking order. Yeah, they have an order of who's in charge of the group. So the more aggressive the chickadee, and they get pretty feisty, I said, but they can get very aggressive with each other. The more aggressive, the higher order they are in. And this is actually how they decide who gets the food first or the best nesting sites. The ones who are in the higher pecking order they're the ones who get the most food, the better food, and also the better nesting sites. Now, I want to wrap up with the ecological status of the black-capped chickadee, and I will let you know they are very numerous. 
The numbers have dropped a little bit, but that's with all species, mostly because of climate change, habitat loss. But the chickadees seem to be faring rather well. They don't mind being around humans. As a matter of fact, they like being around humans because we feed them as long as we keep our feeders full. But we do feed them, so they don't mind being around humans, which is what helps them out. Now, they do like hanging out in the woods, like I said, that's their main habitat. They don't like being out in the open very often. And because of that, with deforestation, that's when they start losing their habitat. But they do adjust quite well. So their status, ecological status, very numerous. Not endangered, not threatened. And that's a good thing because, well, they actually help the environment. They provide natural pest control, so they're helping us too. About 90% of their summer diet is insects. So they're eating all those bugs that we keep trying to get rid of, get out of our yard. So they are good pest control along with a lot of the insectivores, but we can't really call a chickadee an insectivore because they also eat seeds. Um, I'm actually watching one right now at my suet feeder eating the peanuts. So they eat the suet, the peanuts, um, if you want to attract them to your yard, like I said, I'm going to leave a link to the nesting box plans in the show notes that you can check out and maybe make some. I'm going to be making some nest boxes in the next couple of weeks so I can get them out before nesting season. But you can also feed them, put out feeders for them, suet, peanuts, I always do out-of-the-shell peanuts. It makes less of a mess. A um, little pricier, but it makes less of a mess, for the, and, and it's easier for the birds. Um, I also feed black oil sunflower mixed seeds. During the summer, I will put out thistle, and the chickadees like the thistle. So a lot of different foods you can put out to attract them. Also, try not to disturb them too much. So that's how you attract the chickadees to your yard, put out feeders, nest boxes, and keep it a bird-friendly yard. Plant some bushes, give them some place to hide away. That way, they don't feel threatened to come out in the open. But my bird feeders, they're probably about 20 feet from my house, hanging in an old dead tree, and all around it, pretty open, but I do have some bushes within, uh, I'm going to say maybe 20 feet, and the woods are about 40 feet from my house. So provide some sort of shelter for them to get away from danger. So if you enjoyed learning about the black cap chickadee, if you enjoyed listening to this episode, please rate and review it. And don't forget to invite your friends along. The more the merrier. I always love getting more and more people out discovering nature and learning about nature every chance that they get. So invite some friends along. They'll enjoy the podcast as well. If you ever have any nature questions or ideas for future episodes, feel free to drop me a DM or, or just send me an email. You can also let me know if you're interested in joining me on a nature hike, one of my wanderings through nature. I always love the company, and it's good to have someone to talk to while I'm doing the podcast. Um, you can support the podcast through my Ko-Fi page. All the links are in the show notes, so check out the show notes for each episode. And if you love journaling or writing about your adventures in nature. Don't forget that I do have journals online, including some kids' journals, four different children's journals that are more guided journals, showing them how to have fun adventures out in nature. So get out there, explore nature, wander through nature, and above all, keep exploring the nature around you. Did you know that plastic is made with oil, a fossil fuel that pollutes the environment? 
And did you know that only about 15% of all plastic is recycled into new products? Wouldn't it be awesome if we could live our lives without plastic so that we could stop harming the planet? Well, there's a company that wants to help you do just that. Life Without Plastic sells products that will reduce or eliminate your dependence on plastic. They have a large selection from toothbrushes to food storage containers to drinking straws, all plastic-free. And it's reasonably priced. So what are you waiting for? Check out all these great plastic-free products and help save the planet. Just click on the link in the show notes to find out more and to start your journey to being plastic-free.